So in this lecture we're going to look a bit more at rotational motion and then we're going to consider universal gravitation. So this lecture is covered in your textbook sections 10.6 to 10.8, chapter 11 and 13.1 to 13.5. So first of all a quick recap of the most important ideas from the last lecture. In the last lecture we were looking at collisions and we saw that in elastic collisions kinetic energy is conserved. We also considered inelastic collisions where some of the kinetic energy is lost. And we considered perfectly or completely inelastic collisions where the two colliding bodies stuck together. And so they had the same final velocity. And we looked at the equations as applied to each of these cases. In all of these cases, momentum was conserved. We then had a look at a rocket, which is another example of a collision, but what's different here is that there's a changing mass with time. So we saw that we could write for the rocket that the mass times the acceleration is equal to the rate of mass lost times the relative velocity of the fuel with respect to the rocket. And we also saw that the final velocity minus the initial velocity is equal to the relative velocity of the fuel with respect to the rocket times the logarithm of the initial mass divided by the final mass. In the last lecture, we saw that translational quantities have rotational analogies. So an object moving around a circle can have radial and tangential acceleration. We've already looked at the radial acceleration when we were considering uniform circular motion, but if an object is speeding up, then it can also have a tangential acceleration, which can be calculated using r alpha, where alpha is the angular acceleration. We saw that the moment of inertia of a body is given by, the moment of inertia is equal to the sum over i of mi times ri squared, and this is for discrete objects. Or if we have a continuous body, we can calculate the moment of inertia as the integral of r squared, r squared dm. And we saw some examples of how to perform these calculations. We saw for a sphere, the moment of inertia is given by 2 fifths m r squared. Okay, now you actually already know quite a lot about torque. Consider these doors here with the door handle and hinges marked on. Now, which door is going to be easiest to open? Okay, so hopefully it's fairly clear to you that it's easier to open the door when the handle is a long way from the hinges than when the handle is right next to the hinges. So this door here is the easiest one to open. And how do you open it? Well, you open it by applying a force on this door handle, pulling it in a direction which is perpendicular to the door. Okay, so this force that you're applying is actually a torque, a turning force. And the equation for turning force is given by tau, which is our symbol for torque, is equal to r cross f. Now r, this is the vector pointing from the pivot point, so with our door, the, it's pivoted about these hinges to the place where the force is applied. So with our door, we're applying the force on the handle. So R is this vector here. Now the force, that is the applied force. And for the torque to be maximum, it needs to be perpendicular to this R vector here, which is why we pull the door perpendicular to the door itself. So R points from the pivot to the place place the force is applied. So as we know, because this is a cross product, we can calculate it as a sine theta. So we can say, or t sine phi as it's written here. So we can say, well, tau, tau is equal to rf sine phi, where phi is the angle between r and f. Now the units are written as Newton meters, which you may realize is the same as joules, but we never write a torque as joules as the meters vector and the force vector, the Newton's vector, are perpendicular to each other. So it doesn't really make sense to combine them into something called joules. So this isn't an energy, so we just leave it as Newton meters. So here's a problem for you to try. The image below shows the overhead view of a meter stick. The pivot point is the dot, so that's here, 20 centimeters from the left-hand end. 
all five forces on the stick are horizontal and have the same magnitude. Rank the forces according to the magnitude of the torque they produce, greatest first. So with this problem, we've got our rod here. It's pivoted about this point, 20 centimeters from the end. We've got F1 here, F2 is here. Then this point here is also 20 centimeters. From the pivot point, we've got force F3 and force F4, and then we've got force F5 at the end here. And we know that the torque is given by R cross F. And in this case, all these forces have the same magnitude. So we can write this as RF sine phi, where phi is the angle between R and F. Okay, so torque one is going to be equal to the 20 centimeters times the magnitude of the force. So R1 goes this way from the pivot point to where the force is. Force one is at 90 degrees to that. So this is going to be equal to RF. Now torque two, there is no distance between where the force is applied and the pivot point. So R2 is actually zero. So torque two is going to be zero. This doesn't apply any torque. Torque three, again, it's 20 centimeters. So it'll be R, where R is 20 centimeters times F. And like with force one, the angle between R and F is 90 degrees. With F4, you can see that this angle is greater than 90 degrees. So sine phi is actually smaller for force four. So torque four is going to be less than torque one, which will be equal to torque three, and torque two zero. Now torque five is also zero because the radial vector in this case is in this direction, the force is in this direction. And so when we have the radius and the force parallel, the cross product's zero. So torque five is also zero. So we can say torque one is equal to torque three. They are greater than torque four, and that's greater than torque two, which is equal to torque five, which is equal to zero. So now we're going to look at Newton's second law for rotation. We've spent quite a lot of time looking at Newton's second law for the translational case. So we're all quite comfortable using that the net force is equal to the sum of the forces acting, which is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Now for the rotational case, there's an analogous equation. We've got that the net torque is equal to the sum of all the torques acting, and this is equal to the moment of inertia times alpha, the angular acceleration. So let's consider the simplest case and see if we can show this equation. So imagine that we have a massless rod of length r and we place a mass m, a point like mass, on the end of it. And then we apply some force to that mass. Now we'll make our, let our rod have an angle theta with the horizontal and we'll let the force have an angle phi with the radius, the length of the rod, as shown in the figure. Now, if we want to calculate the torque that this force causes, we can use that the torque is equal to R cross F, which is equal to RF sine phi. Phi here is the angle between the radius and the force, just like we've shown in the diagram. So this is actually equal to R times the tangential component of the force. As we can break that force into a radial component and a tangential component. So the tangential component of the force is equal to the mass times the tangential component of the acceleration. That's just an application of Newton's second law for the translational case. And we have seen that the tangential acceleration is given by 
alpha times r, where alpha is the angular acceleration. So let's put all of these together now. We've got that our torque is equal to the radius times the tangential force. So the torque is equal to the radius times m times the tangential acceleration. So the torque is equal to the radius times m times alpha times r. Or we can rearrange that to write it as m r squared alpha. Now for the object we've just described, a massless rod with a mass m on the end, a distance r away, the moment of inertia is just given by m r squared. So you can see in this case the torque is equal to i alpha. But is this generalizable or have we just shown it for the simplest case? Well, we can actually extrapolate this for all cases because whenever we're considering a continuous body, we just break it up into lots of little components and add all those components together. So by showing it for one small component, we can actually extrapolate this to whole continuous bodies. So the generalizable formula is that the net torque is equal to I times alpha. So let's have a bit of a look now at a physical example where we can actually make use of this equation. So the question is, consider the Atwood machine pictured with M1 is equal to 1.0 kilograms, M2 is equal to 2.0 kilograms, capital M is equal to 1.0 kilograms, R is equal to 0 0.10 meters. Calculate the acceleration A of mass M1. Okay, so this question is a little bit different to previous ones where we have ignored the mass of the disc. We now know enough about rotation to account for the moment of inertia of this disc in our calculations. Okay, so in this one, we start with the normal way. We'll use Newton's second law to write down the forces on all of the three bodies in the system. So on mass M1, mass M2, and also on the pulley. So on M1, we've got a tension pulling it up. Because of the pulley, there is a different tension on either side. So we've got tension one over here and tension two here. So using Newton's law with mass M1, we can say M1A is equal to the net force on M1, and that's caused by the tension force. Now, because M2 is heavier than M1, we can safely assume that it is going to accelerate this way. So we can say the tension force is pulling it up and then we've got the weight force pulling it down. Those are the only two forces acting on this mass. On mass M2, we've got the weight of M2 pulling it down and the tension pulling it up. So we've got M2G minus T2. Okay, and now we've got to consider our pulley. We've got two forces acting on the pulley. We've got T1 and we've got T2. And these are going to act to give it torques. So we can write I alpha is equal to the torque due to this one, which is given by R times T2 because it's acting at 90 degrees, it's pulled along the radius, minus R T1, as these forces are acting in opposite directions, so they'll create torques in opposite directions. Now we're going to want to simplify this expression a little bit. So there's a number of things that we can do. First of all, we know that the moment of inertia of a disk is given by a half m r squared. So we can substitute that in for i. We also know that the acceleration is related to the angular acceleration through the acceleration is equal to r alpha. So this tells us that alpha is equal to the acceleration over the radius. So we can substitute both of these into this expression here. So we've got a half m r squared times a over r is equal to r t2 minus t1. Okay, now what we can do is cancel this r with one of these r's and the r on this side with the r on this side, which gives us a half m 
A is equal to T2 minus T1. So let's write that down here. We've got a half MA is equal to T2 minus T1. Now what we have is three equations, one, two, three, that we can solve simultaneously. So we can do one plus two plus three. And this gives us M1A plus M2A plus a half MA is equal to T1 minus M1G plus M2G minus T2 plus T2 minus T1. So now you can see the really nice thing is that this tension cancels this tension, this tension cancels this tension, and the acceleration is common across all of these terms. So we can rearrange this and say, well, A times M1 plus M2 plus a half M is equal to M2G minus M1G. And then we can rearrange it to get our acceleration. Our acceleration is equal to M2 minus M1, let's pull G out as a common factor, over M1 plus M2 plus a half M. And now these are all things that we have. So we can substitute in for our system here and solve this. So we've got two kilograms minus one kilogram times G, which is 9.8 divided by 1 plus 2 plus a half times 1. And then we can solve this on the calculator and we get 2.8 meters per second per second. So this is the acceleration of mass M1. And so we can say M1 has an acceleration of 2.8 meters per second per second upwards. We're now going to consider work and kinetic energy for the rotational case. So we've considered this for the translational case before. It, we've seen the work kinetic energy theorem, which tells us that when we do work on a body, we change its kinetic energy. So the work done on the body is equal to the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. And this holds as long as we have no non-conservative forces doing work. We've seen that we can calculate the work in this case using the integral of f dot dx, where the limits on the integral are from the initial displacement to the final displacement. Now to start an object rotating, we also need to do work on it. For the rotational case, we can calculate the work done on the object as the integral of the torque d theta, where the limits on the integral are from the initial angle, theta initial, to the final angle, theta final. We also end up with an analogous expression for the kinetic energy of a body. The rotational kinetic energy is given by a half i omega squared. So let's have a look at our simplest case now and show that the kinetic energy is given by this expression. So we're now considering the case with a massless rod with length r with a point mass of mass m on the end. We'll let it rotate and the mass is traveling around its circular path with some speed v. If we want to calculate the kinetic energy when the mass is moving with the speed v, we know that we can just use our kinetic energy formula that the kinetic energy is equal to a half mv squared. Now in this case, because it's moving around the circle, the speed, the velocity is given by omega r. So we can substitute that into our equation in place of v. So we've now got that our kinetic energy is equal to a half m and then omega r or squared. Now we can rearrange this expression to write this is equal to a half m r squared omega squared. But as we've discussed with our moment of inertia, the moment of inertia of a point mass is given by mr squared. So we can replace that with i. So our kinetic energy is now written as half i omega squared.
Now this is just for the simplest case, but we can extrapolate from this case to all other cases as when we consider a continuous body, we just break it up into lots of little point masses and then we just sum them all together. So the same thing applies here and we have effectively shown that for any continuous object, the amount of kinetic energy is given by a half i omega squared. We're now going to be considering rolling objects. So let's start by actually watching this cylinder roll. So as you can see, I've put a red dot on the outside of the cylinder and a blue a green dot on the center of mass of the cylinder. So as it rolled, the red dot traced out a fairly complex path. This path is actually known as a cycloid. And you may have noticed that the dot was moving faster at the top of its motion than down the bottom. On the other hand, the green dot traveled with a fairly constant speed along the table. So how do we describe this motion? What well, helps to consider the translational motion and the rotational motion separately? So the translational motion tells us how the center of mass of this object is moving through space. So the speed of the center of mass of a round object is given by V of the center of mass is equal to omega r, where omega is the angular speed of the object. So we saw this equation before when we were looking at circular motion, and that's no coincidence. If we think about how far this disk travels in one period, well the distance it travels is one circumference like this, which is given by 2 pi r, so it goes through 2 pi radians in that period, and the angular speed is just 2 pi divided by the period. Now, as it translates, it's also got translational kinetic energy. So the amount of translational kinetic energy is given by a half mv squared, where the v there is referring to the velocity of the center of mass. Now, as well as that translational motion, we've also got a rotational motion about its center of mass. So this rotational motion is caused by the torque, which comes from the frictional force acting at the radius of the object. So the rotational motion also has an associated kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of the rotational motion is given by a half i omega squared. For a disk like this one, the i is given by a half mr squared, but this holds for any shaped object which could have a different moment of inertia. So let's now have a little think about some objects rolling down an inclined plane. Okay, now we've got an inclined plane set up and I've got two objects that in a minute I am going to roll down the plane. But before I do that, we're going to do a little bit of a predict, observe, explain activity. So these objects are almost the same, except that the masses here, these two bars, are much closer to the center of this cylinder than on this cylinder. So I want you to have a think, if these two cylinders raced down the plane from the same height, which one is going to get to the end first? Okay, ready, set, go. So, as you saw, the object with the, two, with the mass closer to the center got to the end of the plane first. So, can you now write down why you think that occurred? So the object with the masses closer to the center got to the end of the plane first because it has a lower moment of inertia. So we know this because the formula for the moment of inertia is given by I is equal to R squared dm. So when dm is at a smaller radius closer to the center, we end up with a smaller value for I. 
Now at the start, both these two cylinders had the same gravitational potential energy. They were at the same height above the end of my ramp. As they rolled down, that gravitational potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. But as we've discussed, there's two types of kinetic energy. We've got the translational kinetic energy, which is making it move along and which makes one of them get to the end faster than the other, and also the rotational kinetic energy. Now, when more energy goes into the rotational kinetic energy, it means that there's less energy going into the translational kinetic energy. So this object with a higher moment of inertia required more rotational kinetic energy. It's a half I omega squared term was bigger, which meant that there was less energy going into the translational kinetic energy, which meant that it was getting to the end of the ramp after this one with a smaller moment of inertia. Let's have a bit of a look at a worked example now where we'll solve a problem for something rolling down an inclined plane. Okay, so here's an example problem. A cylinder with a mass m and radius r is released from a height h on an inclined plane. Okay, so let's sketch a little diagram. Here's our inclined plane. It's released from a height h here. So this is initial and down here we've got the final. So we'll assume it's released from rest. And we're asked, what is the speed of the cylinder at the bottom of the plane? So we can once again use our energy conservation because there's no non-conservative forces doing work in this case. It's rolling down the plane, so there is friction, but the friction's not actually doing work because it's not sliding down the plane. So we have that the initial potential energy plus the initial kinetic energy is equal to the final potential energy plus the final kinetic energy. Now the initial kinetic energy, if it starts from rest, is zero as it's not moving. So this is zero. And at the bottom of the slope, the height is zero, so it's got zero potential energy. So we can say, well, the initial potential energy, which is mgh, is equal to the final kinetic energy. Now, because it's rolling, it's got two types of kinetic energy. This has got um, rotational kinetic energy plus the translational kinetic energy. So we've seen that rotational kinetic energy is given by the formula a half I omega squared, and the translational kinetic energy is given by a half mv squared. And because this is a cylinder, we know that I is equal to a half m r squared. So we can substitute this in. We've got a half times a half m r squared. Now omega, it's useful to relate omega and v because we've got a v here. So we know that v is equal to omega r. So we can write omega is equal to v on r. So let's replace this omega squared here with v over r squared. And then we've got plus a half m v squared. So this is equal to a half times a half, which is a quarter, m r squared times v squared on r squared. So those r squareds will cancel out. And then we've got plus a half m v squared. So we can write this as a quarter m v squared plus a half m v squared, which is equal to three quarters m v squared. So we've got m g h is equal to three quarters m v squared. And we're trying to get an expression for the speed. So let's cancel out these m's, and then we can say, well, v squared is equal to 4 thirds gh, which tells us that the speed is equal to the square root of 4 thirds gh. So that's how we can calculate the speed of the cylinder at the bottom of the inclined plane. The final rotational quantity that we're going to consider is angular momentum. So angular momentum, as its name suggests, is the rotational analogy of momentum in the translational case. So angular momentum is represented by the symbol capital L. Now we saw in the translational case that we could write Newton's second law, F is equal to MA, where A is the rate of change of the velocity, so we can write this as equal to M dV dt. And then as long as the mass of the body isn't changing, we can write this as dmv dt, and mv was just our momentum p. So this is equal to dp dt. Now in the angular case, we have an exactly analogous equation. We've got 
that the Newton's second law can be written as torque is equal to I alpha, where I is the moment of inertia. So this is equal to I d omega dt, which is equal to d I omega dt, as long as I isn't changing. So I wouldn't be changing if the mass wasn't moving about the body, so we weren't adding extra mass or moving the mass about in the body. And this is equal to dl dt. So from this we can see that L, the angular momentum, is given by I omega, where I is the moment of inertia and omega is the angular speed. So this is exactly analogous to our equation P equals mv, where L and P are equivalent, I, the moment of inertia, is equivalent to the mass, and omega, the angular speed, is equivalent to V, the speed of the body. So let's have a go at a problem using this now. Okay, so in this example, we have a disc here, a hoop, and a sphere, which all have the same mass and outer radius, and are all initially stationary. They are free to spin about their central axis. The same force, F, acts on each of the objects for the same length of time, T. And from greatest to smallest, rank the objects according to their A, angular momentum about their central axis, and B, angular speed. So in the figure, you can see where the force is being applied. So let's solve this now. So in this problem, we've got a disc, we've got a hoop, and we've got a sphere. And they've all got the same radius, so R, 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 and they've all got the same mass. And they're all acted upon by the same force, F, so here's F. And in the first part, we're asked to rank these in order of their angular momentum. So this force here acts for the same amount of time, t. So in order to consider their angular momentum, let's look at the equation. The torque is equal to dl dt. Now the torque applied on each of these shapes, torque is equal to r cross f. For all of these, the force is applied perpendicular to the radius, and so this is just equal to Rf. So they all have the same torque acting on them, given by Rf. So we can write this as Rf dt is equal to dl. They're all starting from rest. The force acts for t seconds. So they start from rest, so L is initially 0, and it's going up to some final L. So integrating this, we've got Rf t and on this side we've got l with the zeros those both give minus zero on each side so we've got the angular momentum l is equal to r f t now r f and t all have exactly the same value for each of our shapes so this tells us that the angular momentum is the same for all of them Okay, now in the second part, we were asked to rank them in terms of their final angular speed. So they start from rest and we need to work out their angular speed. In order to work out their angular speed, we will also need to use the angular momentum, but we will use that the angular momentum is equal to I omega. So the angular momentum is going to depend on the moment of inertia. Now each of these is rotating about an axis through the middle of the shape, so this axis here. So we need to work out how big the moments of inertia are relative to each other. So they've all got the same mass. The one with the smallest moment of inertia is going to be the one which has the most mass closest to the center. So that's going to be the sphere as it has more mass, it's wider at its center than it is at the edge. So we've got that the moment of inertia of the sphere is less than the moment of inertia of the disk. And then the hoop's got the largest because all the mass on the hoop is concentrated near the outer edge. 
Okay, so if we've got a big moment of inertia, we will have a small angular speed in order to have the same angular momentum. So in this case, we're going to have that the speed of the, the angular speed of the sphere is greater than the angular speed of the disk, which is greater than the angular speed of the hoop. Now, as in the translational case, we also have a law of conservation of angular momentum. This tells us that when there is no net external torque acting on a system, then its angular momentum is conserved. So with that in mind, let's try a little predict, observe, explain activity. In a minute, I'm going to sit on this chair and start it rotating. I've got two fairly heavy masses here. Initially, I'm going to hold them out like this, and then I'm going to bring my arms in like this so that the masses are closer to my body. So I want you to predict what will happen as I bring the masses in closer to my body. Okay, so let's try this now. You should now write down an explanation of what you just saw. Okay, so my explanation of what's going on. This is an example of conservation of momentum. Conservation of momentum tells us that the initial moment of inertia times the initial angular speed has to be equal to the final moment of inertia times the final angular speed, or ii omega i is equal to if omega f. Now when I had my arms out, I had a large moment of inertia as the mass was quite a long way from the axis about which my body was rotating. When I bring my arms in, there's more mass closer to the axis so the moment of inertia is smaller. So in order for this equation to be balanced, when I have a big I, I need to have a small omega, so a lower angular speed. And when I have a small I, I need to have a much larger omega, so angular speed. So this is why when I brought my arms in, I sped up and started going much faster. So this brings us to Newton's law of gravitation, or universal gravitation. So the gravitational force between two particles with a mass m1 and m2 separated by a distance r is given by the equation the force is equal to g, which is the universal gravitational constant, which is equal to 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared kilograms to the minus 2 times mass 1 times mass 2 over the distance squared. Now it's a vector, so it needs a direction. The gravitational force is always towards the other mass. So if we're considering the force on mass 1, then it's directed towards mass 2. Now the law of universal gravitation does obey the principle of superposition, which means all the forces add together. So if n particles interact, then the net force on one of the particles is the sum of the forces from the other particles taken one at a time. So the net force on particle 1 is equal to the sum of the forces on particle 1 from all the other forces. That's what this equation is saying. Or if we're considering a continuous body and we want to know the force on a separate particle due to this continuous body, then we can split our continuous body into small increments and just calculate the increment due to each of the parts of the continuous body and then sum them up through integration to get the total force. So here's an example. We're going to consider the arrangement of particles shown. So we've got particle 1, which has a mass of 6 kilograms. We've got particles 2 and 3, which both have a mass of 4 kilograms. 
and we've got this distance a which is equal to two centimeters so you can see particle three is two a from particle one so that's going to be four centimeters and we're asked what is the net gravitational force on particle one due to the other two particles so when we think about it particle one is going to be attracted up here towards particle two and also attracted towards particle three so we could call this one f12 the force of two on one and f13 the force of three on one and what we want to find is that total force so we're going to want to add these two vectors head to tail so f12 and f13 and our resultant force is this one here. Sorry, that should have been a nice straight line, but I'm not great at drawing on this thing. So we want to work out, well, what is this here? And that will be the answer to our problem. So we can use the law of universal gravitation. The F is equal to G M1 M2 on R squared to work out what these forces are. So F12, that's going to be G, and then we've got mass one, mass 2 and the distance separating them is a so divided by a squared and f13 that's going to be g m1 m3 and the distance separating them now is 2a so when we square 2a we get 2 squared times a squared so that's 4a squared okay so what we want to do is add these together with pythagoras's theorem so this will be the square root of g m1 m2 over a squared squared plus g m1 m3 over 4 a squared squared so we can pull the g m1 on a squared out the front and then we've got the square root of in here we've got m2 squared and here we've got plus m3 squared on 4 squared. Okay, so we've now got an expression which we can evaluate. So this is equal to 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 times m1, which was 6, divided by a squared, which is 0 0.02 squared, then times the square root of m2, which is 4 kilograms, plus 4 over 4 squared. So solving this on the calculator, we end up with 4.1 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons. Now, this isn't quite enough because it's asked us um, for the net force and we've got the magnitude of the force, but we haven't given a direction. So what we need to do now is work out a direction. So if we work out this angle in here, that will be a nice way to state the direction. So we can use, well, tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. And so that's g m1 m3 over 2a squared over g m1 m2 over a squared. And you can see many of these factors are going to cancel out. And so we'll be left with m3 over 4 m2 those two are equal so this is equal to 1 on 4 so solving that gives us theta is equal to 14 degrees so we can say um, at an angle 14 degrees to the left of the line joining m1 and m2 those probably more clearly illustrated through the diagram than through my words. Okay, so this brings us to a really important theorem, the shell theorem. So most of the objects that we want to consider the gravitational force between are not particles, they're big. So generally we're going to want to consider the gravitational force between planets and suns and stars. So we can apply Newton's law of gravitation to spherical objects by modeling the objects as though all the mass were at the center of mass. So this lets us apply it easily to stars and planets. So we can actually prove this by breaking it into small spherical shells. So I have gone through this proof in this other video here. So if you're interested in that, watch it because it is a really important theorem. So you're not going to be asked to reproduce the proof because it's a very long proof. 
Now, the really interesting point that comes out of the shear shell theorem is that if we consider a shell of matter, then if we put a point mass inside it, then there is no force on the point mass inside from this spherical shell. So this tells us, for example, if we consider the planet Earth, if we consider the gravitational force on a point somewhere inside the Earth, then to get the gravitational force at this point on a particle that we place there, we only need to consider the mass inside that shell. We don't need to consider any of the mass outside. So that's a really important and powerful point. So let's think about how Newton figured out this law of universal gravitation. So Newton knew that the acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth was 9.8 meters per second per second. He could do experiments to measure that just like we can today. Now Newton also knew that the moon was approximately 60 Earth radii away. So 3.84 times 10 to the 8 meters away. He could work this out by looking at the Earth's shadow on the moon during eclipses. Um, now, Newton knew the moon's orbital period was 27.32 days. We can measure that as well. And he also knew the orbital periods for a number of the planets, which was important later for him to check his theory. So let's see what we can do with all this data. Okay, so if we know how far away the moon is, we can calculate speed. So we know that the velocity is given by the displacement over the time, which in this case it's traveling around a circle. So it's the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r divided by the period. And this is equal to 2 pi times 3.84 times 10 to the 8 divided by the period, which is 27.32 days. So that's 27.32 times 24. So this is 24 hours. Then there's 60 minutes in an hour and 60 seconds in a minute. So this gives us 1022 meters per second as the speed of the moon. Now, if we know the speed, we can work out the centripetal acceleration, which is given by v squared over r. So that's equal to the 1022 squared divided by r, which is the 3.84 times 10 to the 8. So solving this, we get 0 0.00272 meters per second per second, and it's a circular orbit, so it's back towards the center of the circle. So this is towards the Earth. The moon feels a force towards the Earth. Now Newton knew that if we drop something near the surface of the Earth, it would accelerate at 9.8 meters per second per second. And he knew how quickly the moon was accelerating towards the center of the Earth as well. So he considered comparing these. So if we compare these, let's put g divided by the centripetal acceleration of the moon. Then we've got 9.8 as the acceleration due to gravity on the surface. And here we've got 0 0.00272. And this is equal to 3,605 or approximately 3,600. And so Newton notice something special about this number 3600 down here and up here we've got 60 earth radii so when we're dropping something on the surface of the earth it's one earth radii away approximately and this is 60 earth radii away so this is approximately 60 squared so that is how Newton realized that this had to be an inverse square relationship and so that the force was proportional to 1 over the radius squared. Okay, so gravitation around the Earth. Well, the Earth's mass is not actually uniformly distributed. So density varies with the distance from the center of the Earth, but it's also different depending on the composition of rocks. So we can measure the acceleration due to gravity very accurately. 
So the ability to measure these small changes in gravity due to changes in the density of rocks which make up the Earth provides a method which makes it possible to remotely map the distribution of different rock types and the structure of rocks. So a lot of geologists use this when they're prospecting. They can they fly over with instruments which measure the local acceleration due to gravity and from this they can spot more dense regions and depending on what mineral they're looking for, they can work out the probability of it being there. So it's, it's a good way to find interesting areas worth prospecting. Okay, now it also turns out that the Earth is not in fact a perfect sphere. So the radius of the Earth is 21 kilometers greater at the equator to at the pulse. So given this, where do you think G is going to be largest? Okay, so it turns out that G is actually largest at the poles because at the poles you're slightly closer to the center of mass. And the so by getting closer to the center of mass, you're decreasing your distance from the center of mass. And so because the force goes as 1 over R squared, by making R slightly smaller, you are increasing the gravitational force. Okay, so now we're going to consider the effects of rotation. So it does actually affect our experience that we are rotating. So here's a question. What is the centripetal acceleration at Sydney due to the Earth's rotation? And we're told that Sydney is approximately 30 degrees south of the equator. So let me sketch a little diagram of the Earth here. And here's Sydney and we're approximately, this is 30 degrees here. So if this is the radius of the Earth here, then we're rotating with, this is 30 degrees as well, and this length here is r cos theta. So Sydney is rotating in a circle around this radius here. So to calculate the centripetal acceleration, we can use, well, the centripetal acceleration is equal to omega squared r, and so omega squared, that's going to be the speed at which we rotate. And we can calculate that because we know the Earth rotates once a day. So this is equal to 2 pi. So one rotation contains 2 pi radians. And it takes 24 times 60 times 60 seconds to rotate. So this is omega, so we're squaring that. Now the radius of our rotation at Sydney is this r cos theta term, where r is the radius of the Earth. So the radius of the Earth is 6,371. So this is times 6,371 times the cos of 30. And so calculating this, we end up with 0 0.029 meters per second per second. So if we were at the pole, then the radius that we were moving around would be zero. So this would be zero. And at the equator, it would be slightly larger because we wouldn't have this cos 30 term here. We'd have cos zero instead. So we'd have a bigger term. So then it says, if the Earth stopped rotating, would we measure a higher or lower mass for an object sitting on scales? So to do this, let's consider our Earth here. Now our Earth is rotating this way. And let's consider putting a mass, we'll put it on the equator because that's going to have the biggest effect, but it doesn't really matter. Just as long as it's not in the pole, we'll get some effect. Okay, so our object on the equator is feeling a net centripetal acceleration towards the center of the Earth. So this is the resultant force. which is the centripetal force. But there's actually two forces acting upon our mass here. We've got the gravitational force towards the center of the Earth, and then we've also got the normal force. Now, if we're sitting on scales, what the scales are actually physically measuring is the normal force. So this is asking, is the normal force going to get bigger or smaller? So to write that out, we can say, well, the net force is equal to the sum of the forces. And we know that the net force is given by m, m omega squared r, the centripetal force. And that is equal to g 
times the mass of the object times the mass of the earth divided by r squared this here this mass here is the mass of the object that we're putting on our scales and then we've got minus the normal force now the normal force is minus because it's in the opposite direction to the net force which is the centripetal force towards the center of the earth so rearranging this we've got that our normal force is equal to g times the mass of the object times the mass of the earth over r squared um, minus the mass of the object times omega squared r. Now, if the earth were to stop rotating, then this would say that omega would go to zero, and so our normal force would go to g times the mass of the object times the mass of the earth over r squared. So it would actually increase because we're not subtracting off this part here. So that tells us that the scales would measure a higher mass. So the scales would measure a higher mass if the earth stopped rotating. Which tells us that if the earth started rotating even faster, the scales would actually measure a lower mass. Okay, so we're now going to consider gravitational potential energy. So we've looked at gravitational potential energy close to the surface of the Earth before, and we saw that if we were lifting an object up, then we had to do work on it against the gravitational force to get it to this higher height. So at the higher height, it had more gravitational potential energy. So what we're going to do now is consider the, the universal case, where we've got a planet here, with some mass m doesn't have to be a planet any heavy object and we're going to consider a mass here at some distance r from this other mass so this distance here is r and we are going to apply a force to move it to an infinite distance away so r the final r is an infinite distance away and we are applying a force this way against the gravitational force. So let's calculate the work that we have to do in this situation against this gravitational force. So the work is equal to the integral. We are going from an initial distance r to an infinite distance away and the force is moving it gmm over r squared dr. So the force we're applying is in the same direction that we're moving, and we're applying this force to overcome the gravitational force. So this is equal to gmm times the integral from r to infinity of dr on r squared, which when we integrate it, we've got gmm, and then we've got minus 1 on r from r to infinity so this is equal to minus g m m times so i move that minus out the front so i've got one over infinity minus one over r so this is equal to g m m on r so i have done this work adding this energy to move this particle from the distance r from the planet to an infinite distance away. So this was basically how much energy I needed to add to make it escape the gravitational attraction of this planet here. So now because delta u is equal to minus w, we can say that the potential, so often it's just called u, at a distance r from a planet is given by minus this, minus g m m over r. And so at an infinite distance away, this is zero. And then at a distance r, it's got a negative value. So as it moves from this distance to a further distance away, it's becoming 
more positive, our gravitational potential is increasing, which is what we'd expect because close to the surface of the Earth, as we lift the object up against the gravitational force, then its gravitational potential energy increases. So we've got the same pattern here. Okay, so to summarize, we've said that we can assume that u equals zero, an infinite distance from the object. So when r equals infinity, this thing is zero. But in general, u is equal to minus g m m on r. Now, potential energy also obeys the law of superposition. So it's a scalar rather than vector. So it can be easier to calculate than the force because we've just got the one component to worry about. For continuous objects, we can break the object up into small increments and then sum the potential energy of each of these increments using integration. So we can calculate the escape speed of an object leaving a planet. So if an object moves fast enough away from a planet, it can escape the gravitational influence of the planet. And we can use mechanical energy conservation to calculate this escape speed. So let's consider our planet here with some radius capital R and some mass M and we're going to consider a rocket here which is moving away with speed V and it makes it to an infinite distance away. Now at this infinite distance away it's got a final speed equal to zero because we are trying to work out the minimum possible speed it can have and to completely escape this so at the end it doesn't need to have any kinetic energy even if it has no kinetic energy it still escaped it. So we can now use energy conservation. So we've got the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy is equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. And we know that potential energy is given by minus g m m on r. So finally, it's at a distance of infinity. So r equals infinity. And so this thing is zero, because if we put infinity in here, we get u equals zero. And we've said at the end, it doesn't have any kinetic energy. So all the initial energy has gone into overcoming the gravitational potential. So this is equal to zero. Now the initial kinetic energy, that's given by a half mv squared. And the initial potential energy is on at one radius from the planet. So this is given by minus g m m on r. Now you can see the mass of this object cancels out and I end up with a half v squared is equal to g m on r. So that tells me that v squared is equal to two g m on r, which taking the square root tells me that the escape speed is given by the square root of two g m on r. So this problem, consider a plane inclined at an angle of theta degrees above the horizontal with a massless inextensible cord joining m1 and m2 passing over a pulley with radius r and mass m as shown in the figure below. Assume that m1 is sliding up the plane with the coefficient of kinetic friction between the plane being mu k. The tension to the left of the pulley is t1 while the tension to the right of the pulley is t2. Part A, write down an expression for the net force on M1. Part B, write down an expression for the net force on M2. Part C, write down an expression to describe the net torque on the pulley. Part D, use these expressions to come up with an expression for the acceleration of the system. And then part E, how would this expression change if it was sliding down the inclined plane? Okay, so in this problem we've got an inclined plane inclined at an angle theta and we've got m1 on that plane and we've got this pulley here and m2 hanging down here and in part a we're asked to write down an expression for the net force acting on m1 so we know that the net force is given by m1 a and in this case we're told that m1 is moving up the slope so the force pulling it up the slope is the tension in this string. So we've got the tension in the string. Now let's consider the other forces acting on our mass M1. We've got the weight force going down, so that's the Mg. And we can split this weight force into components. So we've got the M1g sine theta pulling it down the slope. And then our normal force is going to be equal to m1g cos 
theta. So we've got the weight force pushing it down into the slope and that causes this normal reaction force here. So we've got M1G sine theta pulling it down the slope and then this reaction force results in the friction so we've got minus mu k m1 g cos theta which is also pulling it down the slope opposing its motion up the slope okay so that's our answer to part a for part b we're asked to write a similar expression for mass 2 so with mass 2 over here we've got m2g which is pulling it down its weight force and then we've got our tension force t2 pulling it up so those are the only forces acting on this second mass so it's a bit simpler we can write m2a is equal to m2g which is causing it to accelerate down and then minus t2 which is pulling it up okay now part c we're now needing to write an equation for the net torque on our pulley here. So it's a disc with radius R and mass capital M. And so we've got the tension here. So this tension T2 is pulling it around this way and tension T1 is pulling it around that way. So because it's moving this way, we know that T2 is bigger. So the net torque, we've got T2, which is acting at radius R. And then we're in the opposite direction, we've got T1, which is also acting at radius R. And we know from Newton's second law for rotation that this is going to be equal to I alpha. So we've written down an expression to describe the net torque there. Now in part D, it asks us to combine these expressions to come up with acceleration. So the first two are fine, they've got acceleration, but we're going to need to work on this third one a little bit in order to get our acceleration. So we know that the moment of inertia of a disc is given by a half mr squared, and the alpha is related to the acceleration through a over r. So we can substitute these two expressions in here. So we've got the i which is a half so we've got i which is a half m r squared times a on r is equal to let's take r out as a common factor r t2 minus t1. Now we can cancel some r's. We've got an r squared here which we can cancel with that r and then we've got an R on both sides, which cancel each other out. So we end up with a half MA is equal to T2 minus T1. And now we've got three equations, one, two, three, which we can solve simultaneously in order to come up with our expression for A. So let's do one plus two plus three. This tells us that M1A plus M2A plus a half ma is equal to t1 minus m1g sine theta minus mu k m1g cos theta plus m2g minus t2 plus t2 minus t1. So these tensions all cancel out and we can pull the acceleration out as a common factor. So we have m a times m1 plus m2 plus a half m is equal to m2g minus m1g sine theta minus mu k m1g cos theta and so then we can rearrange this and we have a is equal to m2g minus m1g sine theta minus mu k m1g cos theta or divided by m1 plus m2 plus a half m. So we've now come up with our expression for acceleration. So if we were given numbers, we could substitute them in. Now in part E, it asks us how would this expression change if m1 was sliding down the inclined plane? Okay, so m1's now going down the plane, so everything's going this way. What's a bit different is that the friction force is then acting up the plane 
So if we wanted to rewrite these expressions, we'd have m1a is equal to, okay, m1g sine theta is now the biggest force, which is pulling it down, but the friction is opposing this. So this is minus mu k m1g cos theta, and then the tension force is pulling it up. m2a, we've now got the, it's being pulled up. So t2 minus m2g. And our moment of inertia is also in the opposite direction as now T1 is bigger than T2. So we've got a half MA is equal to T1 minus T2. Then once again, we can sum all these together. So hopefully you can see we'll end up with A times M1 plus M2 plus a half capital M. And these will cancel, the t's will cancel, and we'll end up with m1g sine theta minus mu k m1g cos theta minus m2g. And so to get the acceleration, we just need to divide by this. So this will be over m1 plus m2 plus a half m, and we get rid of that from there because I divided by it instead. I just didn't want to write it all out again. So this is our new expression. So we may have expected that it would just be the negative of this acceleration as the acceleration has changed direction. But because the friction also changed the direction that it was acting, in the first case it was opposing the motion so it was pulling it back down the slope. In the second case, it's still opposing the motion, but now to oppose the motion, it's pulling it up the slope. It's not quite the negative of this expression. We needed to flip the sign in front of the friction. So our question is, a disk of mass m, 2.0 kilograms, and radius r equals 0 0.10 meters, starts from rest. A hanging mass, m is equal to 1.0 kilograms, is released at t equals 0 seconds. Part A, what is the acceleration of the hanging mass? Part B, what is the angular speed of the disk 2.0 seconds after the mass is released? C, what is the kinetic energy of the disk at this time? D, how much work has been done on the disk? E, what is the kin kinetic energy of the hanging mass? F, has mechanical energy been conserved? Okay, so to answer part A, we should consider the forces which are acting on the hanging mass. So we've got our weight force, which is pulling it downwards, and then there'll be a tension force in the string, which is pulling it up. So we can use Newton's second law to write Ma is equal to the weight force, Mg, minus the tension. Now we can also consider the forces which are acting on our disk here. So we can use Newton's second law for rotation to write down an equation for the disk. So we know that the moment of inertia of the disk times the angular acceleration of the disk is equal to the torques acting on the disk. And in this case, the torque is caused by the tension force, which is acting at radius r. So this is equal to rt. Now, because it's a disk, we know that i is equal to a half mr squared. And alpha is related to our acceleration through alpha is equal to a over r. So we can simplify off some of the r's in this case. This r will cancel this r, and we've now got the equation rt is equal to a half m r a, and so because there's an r on both sides, those will cancel each other out, and we end up with the tension is equal to a half m a. So we can then replace this expression for tension here with the one that we've calculated from over here. So we've got this is equal to mg minus a half ma. We're trying to find this acceleration. So if we move all our acceleration terms onto one side, then we've got ma plus a half. This is a capital ma. It's the mass of the disk is equal to mg. 
And so that tells us that pulling the acceleration out as a common factor and then dividing by what's left, we can write this as acceleration is equal to mg over m plus a half. This is capital M. So this is now something that we can evaluate as in the question we've been given all of these. So the mass of the hanging mass was one kilogram. So we've got one times 9.8 over one plus a half times the mass of the disc, which was two kilograms. So we're doing 9.8 divided by one plus one, which is two. So this gives us 4.9 meters per second per second as the acceleration of the hanging mass. Now in part B, we're asked what is the angular speed of the disc two seconds after the mass is released. So in order to do this one, we'll need to consider our rotational kinematic equations. So just as we have v equals u plus at in the translational case, we have omega is equal to omega naught plus alpha t in the rotational case. Now we know that this disk starts from rest. So omega naught, the initial angular speed is zero. So we can solve for alpha because we know that alpha and a are related through alpha is equal to a over r. So this is equal to a over r times t and we have just calculated a here. The acceleration of the hanging mass is the same as the tangential acceleration of the disk here. So this is 4.9 times 2 over 0 0.10 and so that is equal to 98 radians per second is the angular speed of the disk at the end of the two seconds. Now part C says what is the kinetic energy of the disk at this time? So we can calculate the kinetic energy using this is equal to a half i omega squared. So this is a half. Now because it's a disk, the moment of inertia is a half m r squared and then omega squared we've just calculated this is 98 squared so we've got a half times a half so that's a quarter times the mass of the disc which is two kilograms times the radius squared so that's 0 0.10 squared times 98 squared and solving this we end up with 48 joules now part D says how much work has been done on the disk. Now we could just go back to the work kinetic energy theorem and say, well, if this is its change in kinetic energy, this is the amount of work, but that's cheating a little bit. Let's calculate it using our work is equal to the integral of the torque d theta. And the limits here are from theta initial to theta final. Okay, so theta initial will take as zero and then we need to calculate the total angle through which it's moved in order to get our theta final. So in order to do that we can use our equivalent equation to s equals ut plus a half at squared which tells us that theta is equal to omega naught t plus a half alpha t squared. Omega naught we've said the initial angular speed zero so that's zero. So this is equal to a half times a over r. So that is um, a is 4.9 over r, which is 0 0.10 times t squared, which is 2 squared. Solving this, we end up with 98 radians. So that's our final angle here. We also need to calculate the torque. So the torque is equal to the radius times the tension force. We don't have a value for our tension force at present, so we're going to have to get one. We can get one by looking at this equation here. So rearranging that equation to make tension the subject, we end up with tension is equal to mg minus ma. And so this is equal to mg minus a. This m is the hanging mass. So this is 1.0 times 
9.8 minus a, which we calculated in the first part as 4.9. So this is equal to 4.9 newtons. So now we have the radius and we have the tension. So our torque is equal to 0 0.10 times 4.9, which is equal to 0 0.49 newton meters and this is a constant value so we can now put this into our integral equation here so our work done we're going from 0 up to 98 radians and our torque is 0 0.49 times d theta doing this integral we end up with 0 0.49 theta and that's from 0 to 98 and so this is equal to 0 0.49 times 98. The, when we substitute in the 0, this term disappears, so we don't need to subtract that off. Solving this, we end up with 48 joules. So that can make us happy because we the change in kinetic energy was 48 joules and now we've calculated the work done on this disk and that's also 48 joules and we were expecting these two to be the same and they are okay so part e now asks us what is the kinetic energy of the hanging mass so we know that the kinetic energy is equal to a half mv squared so we've calculated the acceleration of the hanging mass in the first part. So we can use our kinematic equations to work out what V is. We can use V is equal to U plus AT. It starts from rest. The acceleration is equal to 4.9. The time is 2 seconds, and so this is equal to 9.8. So our kinetic energy is equal to a half times the 1 kilogram times 9.8 squared and solving this we end up with 48 joules so let's just put that in the box there and now part f just making some space here has mechanical energy been conserved so in this so in this process, the hanging mass is losing potential energy and that's being converted to kinetic energy of both the disk and the mass. So we'll need to calculate how much potential energy this hanging mass has lost. So we'll need to calculate mgh and to do that we'll need to know what height it's fallen through. So in order to calculate h, we can use our kinematic equation. S is equal to UT plus a half AT squared. It starts from rest, so U is zero. And so this is equal to a half times 4.9 times two squared. Solving this, we end up with 9.8. And so our potential energy is equal to one kilogram times 9.8 for g times 9.8 for the height and solving for that we end up with 96 joules so this is the potential energy that it's lost and that has gone into the kinetic energy of the disc plus the sorry the kinetic energy of the hanging mass plus the kinetic energy of the disc so you can see 96 is equal to 48 plus 48 so this tells us that mechanical energy has been conserved. So in this problem, a cylinder with a length of 10 centimetres, a radius of 5 centimetres and a mass of 2 kilograms rolls down a plane inclined at 30 degrees to the horizontal. It starts from rest and travels a distance of 1.2 metres along the plane. The moment of inertia of the cylinder is given by I is equal to half mr squared. Part A, what is the change in gravitational potential energy as the cylinder rolls down the plane? Give your answer as positive if it increases or negative if it decreases. Part B, what fraction of the final kinetic energy is in the form of rotational kinetic energy? Part C, what is the speed of the cylinder at the bottom of the plane? Part D, what was the acceleration of the cylinder as it rolled down the plane? And E, what is the size of the frictional force acting on the cylinder? Okay, so in this problem, we've got an inclined plane which is inclined at an angle of 30 degrees. And we've got a cylinder which has a length of 10 centimeters. 
it actually turns out that we don't need that length um, and a radius of five centimeters at the top of it it has a mass of two kilograms and it then rolls down the plane it rolls here a distance of 1.2 meters and we're asked in part a what is the change in gravitational potential energy of the cylinder as it rolls down the plane so the change in the gravitational potential energy is going to be equal to mgh final minus mgh initial and the final height's lower than the initial height and we can work out by how much this is our delta h here and by looking at the trigonometry we can see that sine 30 is equal to the opposite which is delta h over the hypotenuse 1.2 so that tells us that delta h is equal to 1.2 times sine 30. so we can write this as mg times h final minus h initial which is mg delta h which we've got here so this is equal to m which we said was two kilograms times g which is 9.8 times the ch change in height which is 1.2 times sine 30 and solving that on the calculator we get 11.76 joules so that is equal to 12 joules to two significant figures. Part B then asks us what fraction of the final kinetic energy is in the form of rotational kinetic energy. Okay, so at the bottom of the slope here, we have rotational and translational kinetic energy. So the rotational kinetic energy is given by a half I omega squared. We're told that because this is a cylinder, I is equal to a half M R squared. And we know that omega and V are related through V is equal to omega R, which tells us that omega is equal to V over R. So we can write this as a half times a half M R squared times omega squared, which is V squared on R squared. So now you can see our R's are cancelling out and we've got a half times a half, which is a quarter MV squared. So that's the rotational kinetic energy. The translational is given by a half MV squared. So you can see that a half MV squared is double a quarter MV squared. So this is equal to two times K rotational. So given that our translational is double our rotational, we have one third going into rotational and two thirds going into translational. So one third of the kinetic energy and two thirds is translational. Okay, part C then asks us, what is the speed of the cylinder at the bottom of the plane? Okay, so at the bottom, it's lost all this potential energy and it's lost it into the rotational and translational kinetic energy. So we've got U initial is equal to K rotational plus K translational. And up the top, we worked out what UI was. It was 11.76. We'll keep all our significant figures for our working here. And K rotational, that's equal to a quarter MV squared. K translational, that's equal to a half MV squared. So we've got a quarter plus a half. So this is one quarter plus two quarters. So that's three quarters MV squared. Okay, now we're trying to solve it for V. So we can rearrange this and say, well, V squared is equal to four thirds times 11.76 and then we're dividing by this mass so the mass is equal to 2 and so this is equal to 7.84 that's the v squared so this tells us that the speed is equal to 2.8 meters per second and again we've given it to two significant figures 
In part D, we're then asked to find the acceleration of the cylinder. So we know its final velocity and we know how far it's traveled. It also is going to undergo constant acceleration because it's got constant forces acting on it. We've got the frictional force and the weight force. So those forces aren't changing. So the acceleration should not change. So because the acceleration is constant, we can use our kinematic equations. And one of those is V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. In this case, the initial speed is zero. So we've got V squared is equal to 2AS. And so rearranging this for A, we have A is equal to V squared over 2S. So that is equal to 2.8 squared over 2. Now S, that's the displacement down the slope. So that's times 1.2. And so this is equal to 3.27 meters per second per second. So that's equal to 3.3 meters per second per second. Now, part E then asks, what is the size of the frictional force acting on the cylinder? Okay, so let's imagine the cylinder at this point. Now, the force is acting on it. We've got the weight force pulling it down. So that has got the component down the slope. This is mg sine theta. We also have the frictional force, which is pushing it up the slope. So with Newton's second law, we can write, well, ma is equal to the sum of the forces acting on it. So we've got mg sine theta down the slope minus the frictional force up the slope. So rearranging it, because we're trying to find the frictional force, we've got the frictional force is equal to mg sine theta minus ma. And now we can just substitute in. We've got 2.0 times 9.8 times sine 30 minus 2.0 times a which was 3.27 and solving that we end up with 3.2 uh, 3.26 which is 3.3 newtons so that was one way to do it there is actually another way to do it as well by considering the torque so if we imagine the cylinder on the slope we've got the frictional force pushing it up this way and that is producing a torque at radius r, um, r. so what we can do is we can use newton's second law for rotation which tells us that the torque the sum of the torques in this case there's only the one torque caused by this force here is equal to i alpha so the torque is equal to the force times the, the cross product of the frictional force with the radius. They're at 90 degrees to each other. So this is just equal to the frictional force times the radius. And I for a cylinder we said was equal to a half mR squared. And then alpha is related to the acceleration as alpha is equal to A over R. So we can rearrange this. We've got our frictional force is equal to a half. Now, mr squared, and we've got an r on the bottom here, and this r will come down the bottom too. So we've got two r's on the top and two r's down the bottom, so they'll cancel out. So we've still got the m and we've got the a. So the frictional force is equal to a half ma, which allows us to calculate it now. So we've got a half times two times a, which was 3.27. So that's just 3.27, which we can write as 3.3 newtons. So these two methods gave exactly the same answer, which is good. So that was a way to check that our answer was actually correct. And another problem. A 0.5 kilogram block is attached to the end of a rod with a length of 0.6 meters. The rod is not of uniform density. It has a mass of 0.5 kilograms and a moment of inertia of 0 0.060 kilogram meter squared about the axis through A. Assume that the block can be treated as a point particle. A bullet with a mass of 1 gram is fired at the block. The bullet embeds itself in the block. When the bullet has embedded in the block, what is the moment of inertia of the block-bullet-rod system? 
And part B, if the angular speed of the system just after the bullet had embedded in the block about A is 4.5 radians per second, what is the speed of the bullet just before it enters the block? So in this question, we've got a rod. It's got a length of 0 0.60 meters and it's got a mass of 0 0.50 kilograms and we're even given its moment of inertia. Its moment of inertia is 0 0.060 kilograms meters squared. And then on the end of the rod is a block that we're told we can treat as a point mass. So the mass of the block is equal to 0 0.50 kilograms. And heading towards that block, we've got a bullet here and the speed of the bullet is unknown. But the mass of the bullet is equal to one gram. Now in the first part of the question, we're asked to calculate the moment of inertia of the system once the bullet has embedded in the block. So let's draw a little diagram down here. We've got our block here with our bullet embedded in it and we're finding the moment of inertia about this point. Now the nice thing about moments of inertia is that they just add together. So the moment of inertia of the system is going to be equal to the moment of inertia of the rod, which we've told, the moment of inertia of the block plus the moment of inertia of the bullet. So the rod we're actually given, so this is 0 0.060. Now we're told that we can treat the block as a point mass. And we know that the moment of inertia of a mass is given by mr squared. So this is just equal to the mass of the block times, now it's a point mass, a distance L from the pivot point A. So this is times L squared. And then for the bullet, because the block's treated as a point mass, we can assume that the bullet which is embedded in it is also a point mass, which is also a distance L from this pivot point. So that's plus the mass of the bullet times L squared. Now the mass of the bullet is so much less than the mass of the block that if you wanted to ignore it, you could. It wouldn't actually make a difference to the final answer, but let's include it anyway. Okay, so we've got 0 0.060 plus the mass of the block, that's 0 0.50 times 0 0.60, that's the length squared, plus the mass of the bullet is 1 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms, because it's only 1 gram, plus 0 0.60 squared. And solving this on the calculator, we get 0 0.24036, but we only want to give it to two significant figures. So this is 0 0.24, and that is kilograms meters squared. Now in part B, we're asked to find the speed of the bullet. So this is what we're trying to find. And we're told that the final angular speed of the entire system is given by 4.5 radians per second. So in order to do this, we're going to make use of our law of conservation of angular momentum. So we know that the initial moment of inertia times the initial angular speed will be equal to the final moment of inertia times the final angular speed. Now we're given the final angular speed and we have just calculated the final angular momentum. So we know both of these. So what we need to do is work out these six. Okay, so let's draw a little diagram to show the moment that we're considering. So we are considering the moment just as the bullet is about to enter the block. So the bullet is moving, but the rod and the block are stationary. So we know that omega initial of the rod is equal to zero because it's stationary. And the initial speed of the block is equal to zero because it's stationary. Now, as the bullet enters the block, it's going to cause it to rotate around this way. So the speed of the bullet is related to its angular speed through our equation V is equal to omega R. And so the initial angular speed of the bullet is given by its initial speed over the length 
of the rod because that's the distance from the pivot point at which it enters the block. So we'll be substituting that in to find our V0. So it's only the moment of inertia of this bullet about this pivot point which is going to count. So the moment of inertia, it's a point particle again. So we're just going to once again use this equation up here, but in this case the mass is going to be the mass of our bullet. So we have that the I initial of the bullet is equal to the mass of the bullet times L squared. And so just substituting everything in here, we've got that the mass of the bullet times L squared, that's the I initial times omega initial, which is V naught on L, is going to be equal to 0 0.24 times 4.5. Okay, and we're trying to solve this for V, so one of these L's cancels out, and we can rearrange this to write, well, V0 is equal to 0 0.24 times 4.5, and now we'll need to divide by the mass of the bullet, which is 1 gram, so 1 times 10 to the minus 3, and then we'll also need to divide by the length, which is 0 0.60. And solving that, we end up with 1,800 meters per second as the speed of the bullet. Okay, so a problem. Let little r be the distance from the center of a spherical planet of radius r and mass m with a uniform density. So write an expression for the gravitational force as a function of little r on an object of mass little m as it moves through a hole drilled through the center of the planet. Okay, so let's sketch our diagram here. We've got this hole drilled through the center of the planet. The planet has a radius r and a mass m, and the distance from the center of the planet is given by little r here. So we want to know, well, what is the gravitational force equal to? And to work this out, we're going to need to make use of our shell theorem. So our shell theorem tells us that we only need to consider the gravitational influence of the material inside the shell. All the shells outside don't contribute to the force on any point inside. So the shell theorem tells us that the object only experiences a net force from the mass inside its shell the outside all cancels out. So we just need to worry about the mass inside this red circle here if we're considering the force when the particle is at this distance here. So we've got F is equal to G times the mass of the object times the mass inside the shell divided by the distance, which is r squared. So we're going to need to come up with an expression for the mass inside. So the mass inside is going to be equal to the volume times the density, which is equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed. That's the volume of this red sphere here. And the density, that's the total mass, which is m, divided by the total volume, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So you can see the 4 thirds and the pi are going to cancel out, and we'll end up with m r cubed over r cubed. So this force is given by g m times m r cubed over r squared times r cubed. And now we've got an r squared here, which will cancel with two of those r's there. So we end up with g m m r over r cubed as the force on a particle at this point here. And then we need to give a direction because it's asked for a force. So this is towards 
the center of the planet. Now part two asks us how much work is done by the gravitational force if the object moves from the center of the planet, so from r equals zero, to the surface of the planet. Okay, so the gravitational force is going to be pushing it back down while it's moving up. So we'd expect this work to be negative. We know work is equal to the integral of f dr, and we're going from zero up to capital R. So this is equal to the integral. Now the force and the displacement are in opposite directions. So I'm going to have a negative sign. And I've got gmm over r cubed times r dr. And my limits are from 0 to r. So I'll move this constant out the front. I've got minus gmm over r cubed. And then I've got the integral of r dr from 0 to r which is equal to minus g m m over r cubed. Integrating this, I end up with r squared on 2, and that's from 0 to r. So this is equal to minus g m m on r cubed times r squared on 2. So uh, r cubed and an r squared, that becomes just an r. And so I've got minus g m m on 2r. So that tells me how much work the gravitational force does as the object moves from the center of the planet to its surface. So in this problem, we've got a particle with a mass of 0.67 kilograms, which is a distance d from one end of a uniform rod of length l, and mass m, and we're asked what is the magnitude of the gravitational force on the particle from the rod. So let's start by drawing a little diagram here. So here's my particle with a mass m, Here's my rod with a mass capital M. This distance here is D, and the length of the rod is L. And we want to know what's the force from the rod on this particle here. So what I'm going to do is break my rod up into little sections and I'm going to consider this section here which is a distance x from this particle and it's got a width dx. And to calculate the force I'm going to need to know the mass of this little increment here. So I'll have dm, the mass of this little increment is equal to the linear density times dx which is equal to m over l dx because it's just got a uniform mass density. So I know that df, which is the force due to just this little increment here on this particle here, is given by g times m times dm, which is the mass of this little increment here, over the distance squared, which is x squared. So I can write that as gm and then this dm is equal to m over l dx, so that's m over l times dx times x squared down here. So now if I want to get the total force, I'm going to have to sum up all these incremental forces along the rod. So total force, I've got f is equal to the integral from, I'm now, I'm going from x is equal to d, that's at this end, to x is equal to d plus l. So I'm going from d to d plus l, and I've got g m m over l times dx over x squared. So I can pull this constant out the front. I've got g m m on l, and then I've got the integral from d to d plus l of dx on x squared, which is equal to g m m on l, and integrating 1 on x squared, I end up with minus 1 on x, and that's going from d to d plus l. And so I can write this as g m m on l times minus 1 over d plus l plus 1 over d which I can simplify as g m m on l and then in here I'll give it a common denominator so this is d times d plus l and here I've got d and that's with a minus and then plus d plus l. So these cancel 
so I've got an L on the top which will cancel my L on the bottom and so I've got this is equal to GMM over D times D plus L. So now I've got an equation that I can substitute into to find this total force. So F is equal to 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11 times the mass of my particle, which is 0.67, times the mass of my rod, which is 5 kilograms, divided by the distance D, which is equal to 0.23, times 0 0.23 plus the length of my rod, which is 3. So solving this one on the calculator, I end up with 3.0 times 10 to the minus 10 newtons, and this is towards the rod. Okay, so in this problem, certain neutron stars, which are extremely dense stars, are believed to be rotating at about one revolution per second. So this means two pi radians per second. If such a star has a radius of 20 kilometers, what must be its minimum mass so that material on its surface remains in place during the rapid rotation? So let's start by drawing a little diagram. So here it is, it's rotating that way. And we're going to consider an object on the equator here. Now we know that the net force on an object at the equator is the centripetal force, and that is given by m omega squared r towards the center. Now this centripetal force is caused by the weight force, the gravitational force towards the center, which is given by g times the mass of the object times the mass of the planet over r squared, or not planet, neutron star in this case. And then we've also got a normal force, which is in the opposite direction. Now, if it is not to fly off, then the normal force has to be greater than zero. So limiting case, is when the normal force is equal to zero. So we can use Newton's second law to write, well, the net force, which is the m omega squared r, is equal to the gravitational force, g m m on r squared, and then the normal force is in the opposite direction, so minus n, and then we're going to take the limiting case. So we'll make this equal to zero in the limiting case, so g m m on r squared. Okay, so we've got m omega squared r is equal to g m m on r squared. So the m's here cancel out, and I'm trying to work out the minimum mass of the planet, which is this capital M here. So this is m is equal to omega squared r cubed divided by g. Okay, so now we've got an equation. Now we can substitute in. Now, the rate of rotation is one revolution per second, which is two pi radians. So omega is two pi, so that's squared, times the radius cubed, so that's 20 times 10 to the 3 cubed, divided by g, which is 6.673 times 10 to the minus 11. So solving this on the calculator, we end up with this is equal to 4.7 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. But notice that we were only given these things to one significant figure, one revolution per second. So let's give this as 5 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, um, and that's to one significant figure.